Let's sing, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Join me in singing Jesus, Thank You, another song that we sang last week. The mystery of the cross I cannot comprehend, the agonies of Calvary. Perfect Holy One crushed your Son, who drank the bitter cup reserved for me. Your blood has washed away my sin, Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied, Jesus, thank you. Once you're in 
Sacrifice I've been brought near your enemy you've made your friends pouring out the riches of your glorious grace, your mercy and your kindness know no end. Your blood has washed away. All right, let's sing a favorite of mine. It's really appropriate in this time of Thanksgiving to think of all the ways that we can bless the Lord for the things that he has done for us. So let's sing 10,000 Reasons Together.
Good morning again, everybody, and welcome to Quail Lake Community Church. We've had a little music, and now it's our chance to get into God's Word. 
Now, we've got a special chapter for you this time. It's Romans chapter 13, and we're going to be taking a look at this, and the title is You and Your Government, so hang on. Now, we're going to pray first, and just to give you a little heads up, we're going to be taking communion again at the end of our service. So if you want to go grab a piece of bread or something for everybody in the room and then something to drink, and we'll celebrate and remember the Lord's death at the very end of our message and our worship time. You know, it's good to be with you, and I'd love to pray for you right now. So would you pray with me? Father, we thank you. Thank you for everyone watching today, and I ask that you will just bless them richly, that, Lord, you will continue to protect them, encourage them, and, Father, remind them that you're a great God and that, Lord, you're in control of what's going on. You've got this handled. So we thank you for that. We thank you that you're a God who can be trusted, a God who keeps his word. And so, Lord, we pray. We pray for our, for our nation. We pray for our leaders, as you've asked us to do. And, Lord, we're going to talk about our government today and pray that you would teach us what you want us to be doing in this whole political realm that we have as citizens of different nations on this planet. So thank you, God, for that. We pray for our people. We pray for the people out there who are hurting. Father, people just struggling with life, loneliness, depression, disease, any of those things that, God, you would be right there and that you'd be comforting them and reminding them that you're going to take care of them, that you're a good God, and we thank you for that. So, Lord, we invite you to be a part of all that we do here and pray that you'll teach us from your word. And so we pray it in the great name of Jesus. Amen. All right. If you've got your Bibles, uh, open them up to Romans chapter 13. And we're going to start off at verse 1. But I want to tell you something that a president said from the 1980s. He said, the most feared words by an American citizen are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. Now, you know, that's been bandied about a whole lot. And that's the way a lot of folks feel. And how we feel about our government is something that's really important. Important to the Bible and important to God. So let's take a look. We're going to start with verse 1 here, chapter 13. And it goes like this. Everyone must submit to governing authorities. For all authority comes from God. And those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and they will be punished. For the authorities do not strike fear in people who are doing right, but in those who are doing wrong. Would you like to live without fear of the authorities? Do what is right, and they will honor you. The authorities are God's servants sent for your good. But if you are doing wrong, of course you should be afraid. For they have the power to punish you. They are God's servants sent for the very purpose of punishing those who do what is wrong. So you must submit to them, not only to avoid punishment, but also to keep a clear conscience. Well, he starts off pretty bold there, doesn't he? Let's take a look at this. You see, when we look at the Bible, there are three institutions that God establishes. Two of them are at the very beginning of the Old Testament. And then there's one that comes in the book of Acts. That's all he gives us, three institutions. One is the family, and the family is, according to him, husband, wife, kids, that, that's it. And then the next thing, right after that, and it comes in Genesis 9, he sets the stage for government. That's it already. And then lastly, the third institution is the church in the book of Acts. Now, so as we look at this, we're talking about the government today, let's remember what's happening around the Apostle Paul as he writes these words. Because we may look at some of this stuff and say, well, he didn't, he didn't have to go through what we're going through, and he doesn't understand how corrupt our people might be. Well, remember who was in charge of the government at the time Paul's writing this? It was Nero, the emperor of Rome. And if you're looking for somebody who's totally corrupt, totally just terrible Nero is your person now, as best we know from historical records available Nero sentenced Paul to death he went on rampages against Christians persecuting them he burned them in his own personal garden and fed them to lions this was a brutal evil human being 
and listen to what Paul is telling us that God wants us to do. The truth that's here that's being told to us is that all authorities are there by the hand of God. It has to pass through his hands before it becomes reality. Now, remember that the kingdoms of this world belong to Satan. And every government is filled with injustice, corruption. But the promise is still that God is there. He's working in the midst of that. Now, one of the disciplines that we've neglected in our society today, to our detriment, is the true study of history. And I know one today, sometimes it's hard to find honest historians. But if you've ever been on one of those shows or, or seen one of those shows, you're watching it and, and read something where they say, well, we always used to believe that history happened like this and it was taught in our schools, but that's not the way it really happened. And we go, oh, no, we were wrong all those years. Why are you believing those people who just came up with this new idea of history? Maybe they are right. But you know what? I never hear them give any backing for this new information that's now true. There's, there's nothing there. We need to think critically. Think critically. How do I know this is true? And this goes for history. It goes from the Bible. It goes for the message you're hearing today. Think it through. Think what you believe. Now, if you look at history, what you see is a constant repetition of governments that will rise and they'll become powerful and glorious and then they just fade away on the earth. Look at your history. It's there. You say, well, we've been here almost 250 years. Friends, that's a blink of an eye in human history. Why does this happen, though? Why do things just fade away? Because people who have power become corrupt. They find ways to live above the law, and especially the laws that they make for other people to obey. But Paul says, we, we believers, we're to submit to governing authorities because all authority comes from God. And those in the positions of the authority have been placed there by God. Now, there's a, another thing that you need to remember. All those people who are in authority, whether it's your elected officials or judges, God says he's going to judge those people differently. They're going to be judged more harshly. But to understand all of this stuff, we need to go back to Romans 1. Why is this happening? Why are we where we are today in our planet's experience of life? Well, Paul writes in Romans 1, and we believe that this is God's inspired message to us. But in Romans 1, he says this. We're going to start at verse 21. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. And as a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served the things that God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. So that's what's happened to us as a human race. So when a nation begins to decay spiritually and morally, God's judgment is to abandon them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desire. So how that translates is we get the government that will support those desires. And that's from the White House to the State House to the City Hall. So God allows us to live under a government that reflects the heart of a nation. The problem is our hearts are pretty corrupt. So governments are allowed to be instituted to accomplish the purposes of God. Now the thing you have to remember when you're when we're talking about this whole thing, is that God plays the long game. You may never really see what God was doing while you were walking on this planet, but working he is. Now, let's go back to this Roman government because we want to get the setting for Paul saying all this stuff. It was just about as corrupt and tolerant or even supportive of evil as you could possibly imagine. But one of the things that happened during that time is what the historians called the Pax Romana. It was the Roman peace. 
as the gospel is being preached, the world of the Roman Empire was relatively safe. And one of the things the Romans did was they built roads. And with the huge military presence, there was some degree of protection that went with that. But with these roads that were originally designed for trade, but also for Romans to be able to move armies back and forth and supplies and all of those things, what happened was people could travel. And travel they did. They traveled in trade. They traveled in discovery. And they traveled in sharing the gospel from place to place. But because of this corrupt government, the message of God's grace spread from city to city, territory to territory, country to country. So when we hear what God says, he says, don't rebel against this authority. When we rebel against it, we're rebelling against what God has instituted. And the question, though, that's sitting out there, sort of like that proverbial elephant that we always talk about in the middle of the room, is are we then never to disobey those who are in authority over us? No. There comes a time for saying no to those in authority. But you have to remember what the Bible talks about when it's giving you the right to say no is it's on spiritual issues, not political, but spiritual issues. One of my heroes is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was a German pastor during the Second World War. He was actually in America, went back to Germany under Hitler's uh, reign there. He was a pastor there, a preacher, a theologian, honest follower of Jesus Christ, and he ends up being part of a group whose aim is to assassinate Adolf Hitler. You say, wait a minute. The Bible just said here that, you know, all this stuff about submit to the government. Well, the reason was is because all of Nazism was intent on crushing the spread of the gospel and the followers and the following of Jesus. That was a part of what was going on. Now, we think only Jews were persecuted under National Socialism in Germany. But no, it was Jews and gypsies, homosexuals, and Christians. We were all there. Years ago, I had an opportunity to go to Europe with some college buddies, and we came to a concentration camp in Belgium. It was called Fort Breendonk. And the reason we went there is that there was something unique about this concentration camp. It was an old World War I fort that had been used during that period. And then when the war, First World War, was over, they just abandoned it. And over the years, decades, that dirt and everything, it just filled up this fort. It was a low-lying fort. And so the Germans came in and they refitted it and made it a concentration camp for their political undesirables. And the thing that was different about Fort Breendonk that made it so unique was when it was liberated, they didn't burn anything down, they didn't destroy anything, they kept it just the way it was. So you could walk into Fort Breendonk like so many other people did when they were being persecuted by the Nazis. And when we walk through there, we walk through cells. And we walk through places where on the walls were scriptures that were written, New Testament scriptures. One had a picture of Jesus, and then another had other Christian writings. These were followers of Jesus who were held there who said no to the government. We see the first account of that in Acts chapter 5. Peter is forbidden to speak any more of Jesus. And he says to them in that chapter, Sorry guys, we need to obey God rather than men. But the issue is always that we're objecting on the spiritual level, not the political. We represent God's view. The Bible's in our walk, and with others on this planet. That's what we focus on, not just our own opinions. But remember, that's not to go with uh, a feeling or an idea. We say, well, I think the Bible would support this or whatever. We need to find a scriptural mandate in context that we can follow. He goes on and says in verse 3, the authorities do not strike fear in people who are doing right, but in those who are doing wrong. Classic example of that is the officer who's on traffic detail who's checking speed limits. You know what that's like. You're out on the freeway. Everybody is supposed to be going 65. We're going maybe 70. Creep up to 72 or something like that. Maybe 
guys are passing you at 75. And then all of a sudden comes a black and white highway patrol car. What happens? Everybody slows down to 65 miles an hour. And you got your, you're watching exactly where your speed is going at that time. Everybody throttles down. He's there to keep us safe. The reason is we have drivers out there with a whole gamut of driving skills. And some of them are just not that skilled. And that's a speed that we hope will keep as many people alive as possible. You know, years ago, I had an opportunity to ride with a CHP officer. And it was on a, the end of a three-day weekend. So lots of folks were out. And we were on 99, the highway that comes up and down California. And um, he told me what we're going to be doing tonight is, uh, you know, we're going to be watching for people who are really abusive of the law and the speed limit. But our aim is not to write a whole lot of tickets. And he didn't. We pulled a couple of people over. But people were going kind of fast that night. They wanted to get home. They wanted to get back to their beds and sleep and get ready for work the next day. But he said, what we're going to try to do tonight is just slow people down so they can get home safely. That's what the authorities are supposed to do. But then he goes on and says, the authorities have the power to punish you, that they are God's servants sent for the very purpose of punishing those who do what is wrong. Now, where you see the first action of government is in Genesis 9, 6. I told you it was right there at the beginning of the Bible. And God gives a word concerning the way government is to function. It is to function as a deterrent to evil through the implementation of capital punishment. That's the first thing we see. Now, that offends the sensibilities of a lot of folks to hear, but it's right there in the Bible. It was the one thing that God wanted us to know was that for the taking of a life from one person, they're to forfeit their lives then. And so Paul is working from that initial shaping that God gave humans the right and responsibility to let humans of the earth share in the policing and governing of themselves. So we're to submit to those in power for our own safety's sake, but also for the sake of a clear conscience. Well, he goes on, and he hits uh, real close to home on something else. In verse 6, pay your taxes too for the same reasons. For government workers need to be paid. They're serving God in what they do. Give to everyone you owe them. Pay your taxes and government fees to those who collect them. and Give respect and honor to those who are in authority. Well, there's that old story about the lady. She's at a Denny's or a place like that, and, and she's with her daughter, and all of a sudden the daughter begins to choke. She can't breathe. And the mother panics, and she stands up, and she screams out to the whole restaurant, My daughter's choking. She swallowed a nickel. Please, can anybody help her? And immediately a man stands up doesn't say a word he rushes over to her and he turns to the mom he says i'm experienced in these situations so she steps back he calmly steps over to the girl with no look of concern he wraps his arms around her he squeezes her and out pops the nickel and the man just turns back and goes and sits down at his table the mother's in tears and she's crying she says thank you tell me are you a doctor and he says no i work for the irs well, that's unfortunately how we look at it so many times, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, we're just a bit less than a month and when we're actually doing this until our taxes are due. Paul says we do that because our government workers need to be paid. And what they are doing is a service to God. The taxes that's used here in this scripture would be comparable to our income tax. The government fees uh, or customs, if you have a different uh, translation, uh, is similar to a sales tax. We pay a lot of taxes. Every time you buy something, you're being taxed. Every time you make something, you, you, you're being taxed on that. And most of us hate all the stuff we see that our taxes are going for sometimes. And that's, there's a lot of ungodly stuff out there. We understand that. But remember, Nero was the ruler of the Roman Empire at that time. And he wasn't setting up tons of stuff that were labeled good or even moral was it setting up daycare centers for kids or hospitals or things like that? No, there were tons of bad things that that money was being used for. So there are two things here that we need to respond with to this scripture. 
first, we're being asked to just trust God and follow what he asked us to do. And second, you need to remember those who are behind this kind of stuff will take that record to that judgment meeting with God. It goes with them. So Paul says, pay your taxes. And Jesus affirmed this already. Jesus talked about taxes? Yeah, absolutely. In Matthew chapter 22, starts at verse 17. Flip over to that if you've got your Bible. And what happens is there were a group of guys who were actually trying to trick Jesus. And so they start this way. And they're talking to Jesus. And the Pharisee says, now tell us what you think about this. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Jesus knew their evil motives. You hypocrites, he said. Why are you trying to trap me? Here, show me the coin used for the tax. When they handed him a Roman coin, he asked, whose picture and title are stamped on it? And they said, Caesar's. Well, then he said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. Yeah, we need to pay. That's it. Well, then he goes on. He talks about another obligation we have, but it's a lot different. Starts at verse 8. Owe nothing to anyone except for your obligation to love one another. If you love your neighbor, you'll fulfill the requirements of God's law. For the commandments say you must not commit adultery, you must not murder, you must not steal, you must not covet. These and other such commandments are summed up in one commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to others. So love fulfills the requirements of God's law. This is all the more urgent, for you know how late it is. Time is running out. Wake up, for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Well, Paul puts it all into perspective here. We'll always have some degree of discontent with our government. As one person said, I love my country. It's my government that I'm struggling with. But what God is saying is that he'll take care of any payback that needs to be made. And he reassures us here that he really does know what he's doing. So God is going to be God. And we are going to be his ambassadors to let people know about his love and this one-time amazing grace offer. We're to go out there and show the loving kindness of Jesus and he'll handle the settling of accounts with those who choose not to accept his free offer of grace. When we love, we just can't go wrong. We tell the truth. Sometimes people don't like it, but we love folks even in that kind of situation. And then in verse 11, he says something that's really important for us to hear today. And that is that time is running out. It's running out for us personally, but it's running out for the human race corporately. He says, wake up for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Oh, what do you mean salvation is nearer now? I thought I was already saved. You told me that all I had to do is pray the prayer and follow and I'm saved. You said give your heart to Jesus and that was it. Well, you are. You did. The thing is, is that as you look out at your world, it didn't change, did it? All the wrongs and injustices that we live with are still a part of our lives. But part of your salvation is the day is coming when all that will change too. You see, we've experienced salvation on the inside. But later, when we wrap up this story of the human race, you'll experience it externally, all around you too. Life will be different. And that's what's living f worth living for. And that's what Paul is saying. The clock is running. We are closer today than we've ever been to the end. Life on this planet, the return of Jesus Christ himself, it says that in the Bible, and to a whole other plane of existence which you were originally designed for is one day closer. Well, then he closes with these words. The night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the shining armor of right living because we belong to the day. We must live decent lives for all to see. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness or in sexual promiscuity and immoral living or in quarreling and jealousy. 
Instead, clothe yourselves with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and don't let yourself think about ways to indulge your evil desires. So he closes with a reminder and a warning. He calls what we are living in right here, right now, the night, the darkness. But he says the day of salvation will be here soon. That's when it's daybreak. So what do we do? We're in the night. What are we supposed to do right now? Well, he says, get rid of your dark deeds. He says, like dirty clothes, just take them off. Get rid of it. You know, the first church that my wife and I went to out of seminary, we were there and we did a special thing with kids we called Wells Fargo. And essentially what it was was an excuse to get a whole bunch of kids really muddy. And you divide it into two teams and then you buried a treasure chest out in the middle of this field. And then what would happen is the two teams had to run out, find the treasure chest, slopping through all this mud, and then drag it back across to their own finish line. And that was the winning team. Well, some folks in that locality found us the perfect place. It was this black, gooey mud. It was wonderful. And it could be kept in mud. And it was the right size. And so we filled a busload of kids, came out there, and we went and did Wells Fargo in the mud. And it was awesome. We had people filming it. We had the local newspaper covering it. It was great. And when we had, were all done, we had all these filthy kids and one filthy youth pastor on the bus. And as I got on the bus, I asked somebody, I said, you know, I was just kind of wondering, why is the mud black like that, though? And one of the folks looked at me and said, well, for years it was what we would call here a hog wallow. It's where the pigs used to live. And I thought, oh, no. Well, I got home to my little house. My wife, Cindy, was there. And I started to come in, and she said, not a chance. You're not coming in with those clothes on. You just strip off there on the patio outside, and we will Throw them away, and we did. And that's what we're being asked to do. Paul's saying the same things. Take off those dark deeds that are still a part of our lives and, and thinking and get rid of them. Put on the shiny, clean stuff of right living and get ready to come on in. The reason is that when you come to Christ, you no longer belong to the night. You don't fit. As a matter of fact, you make everyone else feel pretty uncomfortable. Instead, you belong to the day, the day where there's a whole new life to be lived that others will unfortunately never know. And we allow our lives to be seen. They get to look at us. And then he goes into all kinds of stuff that we're not to be doing. He says, this is to be a part of the darkness of the human race. Wild parties, drunkenness, sexual promiscuity, immorality, quarreling, jealousy, probably could have gone on and on. He just says, don't do that. Don't do it. Then he finishes this chapter by urging us to clothe ourselves with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. What in the world does that mean? Well, what it means is put Christ first in your life and then go out there and get out the word of God to folks because that's going to be the difference between life and death for many. Don't put yourself in a position of easily falling into some kind of sin. You know your weaknesses. Run away from that stuff. Don't kid yourself. You get sucked right back into it if you start playing around it. You know it's not good for you, for your life, your family, or honoring for your God. We're one day closer to the promise that Jesus made. He said he would be back. Before you know it, we'll be out of here and we'll be there with him. So, there we go. We started with government, and we ended up in a whole different place, didn't we? Well, there are three things, though, that we can take home today, that we ought to take home today from this. The first thing is, understand that no political party will ever be able to save mankind. Now, if you believe that a political party will save America or any other land, you just haven't been paying attention. Now, there are some that are more friendly to the gospel than others, but they will not bring the justice and peace and hope, love and salvation that we're looking for. 
And why is that? Because they're people just like us. They're sinners, just like we are. But for them, they live in a world, many of them, of disconnect from people and from reality. And for them, often, godliness is just a fantasy to them. I'm not saying don't get involved. I'm saying you only have so many chips to play in this game of life. Put your chips in the winning hand where they'll do the most good. And that's with Jesus. You see, the government they can't do it. They can't do it. And even if they could, I don't think they would want to move in that direction because they'll always have to play to the lowest common denominator because elected officials need one thing that you have. Someone said that when a pastor loses one person out of their church, he is just totally distraught. But whenever a politician gets 51% of the vote, he is totally ecstatic. And that's kind of the way it is. Because there's one thing that you bring, one thing that you have, and that's your vote. So vote, and vote wisely, because you'll get the government that most of us will vote for. Secondly, pray for your leaders. There's usually about half the country that's distraught over whoever is in power in our country, state, or local government. They think the world has ended. The other half is relieved because they know the Savior has appeared and saved us from certain ruin. We're all broken people. And, you know, folks who get involved in politics, there's so much that goes on. The corruption and power and attention that's laid before them. So pray for your leaders. Pray for those in government. Ask that they will truly be used by God to be instruments of his will for our country and our world. Take that really seriously and see what God might do. Because remember that God is telling you and me to submit ourselves to them. So ask God to make them the kind of leaders, the kind of leaders that are worthy of the submission that you'll give to them. And then lastly, make what is important most important to you. What is really important to you right now? I mean, if you've thought about it, the most important thing in your life. You know, the same Paul when he came to a raucous city called Corinth, he told them that he was going to be totally focused with them. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he said, When I came to you, he said, I decided that while I was with you, I would forget everything except Jesus Christ, the one who was crucified. See, the most important thing for us is to make sure that people have the opportunity to hear the gospel. And it's really simple and it's concise. And Paul wrote it to that same Corinthian church so many years ago. 1 Corinthians 15, he said this, I passed on to you what was most important and what had been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scriptures said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as scriptures said. This is our biblical job. This is what we are now assigned to do. Now, I know there are lots of good and noble things that we can get involved in. And some of those we ought to. But this is job number one. You see, there's another pandemic that's been going on for thousands of years. We've had this one for, you know, about 12 months now that we're dealing with here with the coronavirus. But another one's been going on. And we have the vaccine for that one, too. It was actually given to us on a cross the vaccine was forgiveness, paid for by the blood of Jesus, who is the Christ. It was his death in place of our death, if we want it. His blood, payment for every sin that you or anyone else will ever commit. What you have to remember is that today, you know, if we started it at midnight, you know, as we start this day, by midnight tonight, statistically, 200,000 humans will have left this earth. That means they've died. And for them, it's too late for any kind of change. You can't change their minds or their hearts. Tomorrow, another 200,000 will die. The thing is, you have the vaccine in your hands. It's in your heart, and it's in your soul. So give them a chance. That's what God is saying. You're doing all this stuff to give them a chance to live. Give your kids a chance. Give your grandkids a chance, your family a chance, your friends, your buddies. 
and the people of your country a chance to know this Jesus who is the Christ. That's what he's asking. And we have to remember how this vaccine came to us and how it was put into our hands. And we remember that by celebrating and remembering the Lord's Supper. And so we're going to do that today. If you'll take that bread and cup and get it close by, we're going to take communion again today. And we're going to remember what Jesus said on the night before he went to the cross to pay for our sins. And that night, it was the Passover supper that they were celebrating together. And all his disciples were gathered around the table. And he took bread and he took it and broke it and blessed it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. And he told them to take and eat it. And then after the supper, he took a cup and he held it before them. And he said, this cup now is the cup of a new covenant, new deal with God. And it is sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of your sins. He said, take and drink this. And then he told them something that we've carried on for the last 2,000 years years that is he said do this in remembrance of me and the apostle paul told us as long as you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the lord's death until he returns and return he will and so we're going to do that we're going to proclaim the lord's death to one another and to ourselves to remember where the vaccine has come from so i'd like you to just pray with me one of the things we always take seriously is the Bible says that we ought to examine ourselves before we eat of this bread and drink of this cup. And when we do that, what we do is not to see if we're good enough, but to see how good God has been to us. And if there are things that we want to confess or repent of or any of those things, you know, God's there. He's forgiven us on the cross. We have a chance now to come clean with God. So let's do that. Let's just have a quiet time before God. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. And we're just going to come quietly before you and consider all the good you've been, how wonderful you've been to us, tolerant, patient, loving, forgiving, all of those things. And so hear our hearts now as we come and speak to you. God, we thank you. You are a good God. You've loved us through so much. And you promised us you'd never stop loving us. Thank you for that. We ask now that as we take this bread, that it would be to us the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as we drink from this cup, that, Lord, it would be to us his blood, which was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Thank you for your goodness and love to us. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, gave it to his disciples, and he told them, take, eat, and so together, let us eat of this bread. Then after the supper, he told his disciples, this cup again is the cup of the new covenant of my blood. My blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and drink all of it. Thank you, Lord, that we have been able to remember, as you have asked us to do, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for what you've done for us. And remind us, remind us that we have the opportunity to share what you've given to us, the world around us, that they might come to know the love and kindness and goodness and grace of the God who is there for them. Thank you, Lord. And we pray these things in your name, in the name of Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. Well, folks, that's it. And we're sure glad that you joined us this Sunday. And I'd like to bless you before we go. And a reminder, though, before I do the blessing, is that we're holding services in person at Quail Lake at 10 o'clock every week now on Sundays. And you can bring your own chairs 
and uh, we're going to space you out uh, so you're comfortable, and, and we've got, a, got a, just a wonderful time out there in a beautiful place called Quail Lake Community Church. So we hope you come and join us one Sunday soon. But let me bless you right now. Now may the grace, mercy, and peace of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and forever and ever. Amen. Well, God bless you all today and this week. Remember that God loves you. I love you too. And uh, remember, look for the good things that God's going to have for you. God bless you all. We'll see you next time.